deprived and very delirious. Paul and I learned today that that is not good for you. Right, we're getting dumber and meaner and fatter. <laughs> <laughs> Just as the day progresses. And dying. Yeah. And dying. And dying. Yeah. So we're, we're at ACP. Uh, oh. As you can hear, I'm with Stuart and Paul. Uh, Stuart's yelling from a mountaintop. And with us oh. is our good friend, Aaliyah Chisti, returning from, I think it's been like 120 episodes-ish, maybe 130. Sure. Just, yeah, 120. Hi guys, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> thank you, thank you for taking some time out of like your busy conference schedule to come and uh, yeah, I don't know, do whatever this insanity <laughs> is that we're about to do here. I get to hang out with you guys, it's the best. <laughs> yes. All right, so we have some people that are actually going to go do more learning, so we should uh, we should get right to it. But maybe Paul can tell them what we're going to somewhat somewhat what we're going to do today. Sure, rather than the usual experts, it's us, which is fine because we're smart people. So we're, we're just going to recap a lot of the clinical pearls and sort of high points from the conference sessions that we attended here at ACP's 2019 uh, conference. So a bunch of us went to a bunch of things. We have a bunch of knowledge bombs to drop on you. That sounds awful. I, I think we should just go, um, well, why don't we start with Aaliyah? Why don't you, why don't you start with a pearl? If you're, you look like you're not ready, so I can call <laughs> the whole team here. Just palpable panic. How about you, how about you go next? Let's, right. let's bring Molly up. Let's bring Molly up here. Thank you, Molly. No problem. <laughs> Molly has a ton of stuff. Who's on first. All right, happy to join. Okay, so uh, I attended a few lectures today. They were all great. Um, so I'm going to start with one. Um, some pearls from new drugs with Dr. Gerald Smatana. Uh, so the first one is there's a new medication that is approved this year, so we'll be seeing it more coming out for influenza. It's called baloxavir. Uh, it's pretty similar clinically to oseltamivir, so it reduces the duration of flu by about one day. Uh, it's a little bit different in that it's a novel antiviral mechanism, so we have seen some resistance coming out to oseltamivir, so perhaps this will become more common. It's just a single dose, so a little more convenient for patients to take. It is more expensive, of course, $157 as compared to about $50 for a course of oseltamivir. So keep an eye out for beloxavir this fall. And then the other new medication, we're having some trouble saying, uh, Solramphetol. Solramphetol. <laughs> Solramphetol. Thank you, people. Excellent. <laughs> All right, we've got some Solramphetol. So this one is approved for daytime sleepiness associated with obstructive sleep apnea. So we know that about 10% of patients with obstructive sleep apnea who are as optimally treated as they can be with CPAP are still symptomatic, and some patients just can't tolerate CPAP. How about APAP? Mm -hmm. Some are still symptomatic with APAP. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, women tend to be more symptomatic, younger patients, and then those with general poor health or depression tend to have continued symptoms with OSA. And so this medication is a novel reuptake inhibitor of dopamine and norepinephrine. Um, it's possibly a little bit more effective than our currently approved medication for sleepiness with OSA, which is modafinil and armodafinil. Um, it is not quite as stimulating, but does still have some concern about stimulant potential, so it will be a controlled medication. Can, can I ask Molly or anyone else, are you using modafinil? Personally? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I don't use a lot of modafinil for my patients, but um, if they have concomitant sleep apnea and depression, I would use Welbutrin, which essentially has the same, you know, it's a little bit of a, more of a dirtier medication than Solramphetol, but um, does have some of the, the same adverse events, I mean, it's stimulating, it's actually used off-label for ADHD as well, so I wonder, I, I wonder if it's more, is it more effective than, say, Welbutrin, or... I'm sorry, not Bupropion? Well, Bupropion is not approved. Ill right? Bupropion. <laughs> but this, but is not, okay. this is not the same issue. It's because, sorry, this medication will have the same issues because it's a dopamine reuptake inhibitor. So all the ill butrin issues with Bupropion are probably going to be the same for Solramphetol. Well, I just want to say it one more time. <laughs> all right. Um, the next 
talk, I wanted to highlight a few pearls from was drug allergies with Dr. John Kelso. Uh, so he highlighted the fact that only five to 10% of patients who say they have a penicillin allergy are actually truly penicillin allergic. So about 95% of our pen allergic patients can actually take penicillin safely. And we know that being uh, labeled with a penicillin allergy leads patients to be treated with um, less effective or antibiotics that have more side effects. So this is important to think about. Yeah, that was, no, go ahead. That was the prior episode, Netta, Netta Freha was telling us that she basically like, th there's increased MRSA, increased C. diff risk if you are labeled with a penicillin allergy. Mm -hmm. She herself was mis probably mislabeled and was like getting tested, so get yourself tested. <laughs> <laughs> so we can just test other antibiotics, right? We cannot test other antibiotics, yeah. So if you, if you have a patient who has a good story for a penicillin allergy, you can send them to an allergist for a skin prick test. We don't really have reliable testing for um, other antibiotics. So if the skin prick is positive for other antibiotics, that's somewhat reliable that they probably do have an allergy. But if it's negative, it's not reliable, so it's not often done. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that 98% of truly penicillin allergic patients can tolerate cephalosporins. So especially if someone has a distant history of a kind of a mild reaction, so maybe just hives, we can feel very safe giving an oral cephalosporin. We might want to be a little careful if someone had a recent severe penicillin allergy and would probably want to avoid IV cephalosporins. And then from Dr. Rebecca Hutchinson, uh, she gave a talk on palliative care in non-cancer patients. She brought up the fact that we spend a lot of time in medical education talking about diagnosis and less on prognostication. And it can be really important for our patients to be able to understand their prognosis and for us to be able to recommend treatments if we understand kind of what their trajectory is. So just something to think about we can uh, try to learn more about. Yeah, so the Jerry Powell did an episode on that, um, which was, I don't know if we'll have show notes for this, but look at the Jerry Powell there podcast. There won't be show notes for this. There won't be show notes, I can tell you that. Yeah, we're going to release this pretty quickly, so there won't be show notes, but Jerry Powell did a podcast on prognostication, so you can look that up. Cool. And then um, a treatment that's often recommended by palliative care doctors for um, dyspnea is to uh, have a fan blowing air in your face. Um, <laughs> I'm sure we're going to say apply a fan. Yeah. We're going to say apply a fan. <laughs> um, and so uh, there actually was a randomized control trial published on this in the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management just this past year. And it showed that blowing air in your face does actually help re reduce dyspnea more than blowing it on your legs. And then uh, another study she highlighted was the one that we have discussed in a prior Hot Cakes episode from the um, Journal of Emergen and sorry, Annals of Emergency Medicine in 2018 about isopropyl, isopropyl alcohol smelling to reduce nausea. So basically just an alcohol pad under the nose helps reduce nausea within 30 minutes. Yeah, I've seen patients uh, in, I think it was the PACU, they were putting them underneath the nasal cannula, like one on each side. I was like, oh, that's an interesting delivery system for that. Yeah, I guess that works, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, those are all mine, I don't know who's up next. Those are fantastic, thank you, Molly. Mm -hmm. I think, I think Aliyah's up next, if it's, uh, are you ready now? I feel like <laughs> Okay, let's go. Um, so, I'd actually like to share a couple of clinical pearls I, I learned from the Clinical Pearls Infectious Disease and Oncology session. It was moderated by John Bundrick, and um, our two panelists were Randall Edson and Andrea Weiner Hendrickson. And um, one of the cases that I really learned about that I realized that maybe I've seen this and didn't really recognize it when I saw it in the hospital is a case around a 68-year-old woman. She'd had uh, multiple syncopal episodes, um, was admitted with a femoral fracture, and has a history of um, squamous cell carcinoma of the neck, status post chemo and radiation. And th you know there were some concerns around just maybe she had some VTAC, some abnormal electrolytes. And this was actually thought to be a side effect of her chemotherapy, that she had something called renal magnesium wasting. And that can be caused from multiple chemotherapy agents, including buttons, iphosphamides, and even the monoclonal antibodies, which are some of our newer agents. And that it can cause direct damage to the renal tubules, and so you'll see a lot of hypokalemia and also some profound hypomagnesemia. And that that can actually be a reason why they're having their you know, electrolyte disturbances and then maybe their syncope. And so that was, to me, it's, Something that I yeah. should be paying attention to. That's great. To. I, I bet you I've missed cases of that too. I'm sure I have. Yeah. It, it kind of reminds me of like asking patients who have had uh, radiation for breast cancer about like thinking mm -hmm. of them as higher risk for heart disease right. and then uh, for chemo for neuro uh, neuropathy, taking that history as well. I always, well, until we learned that on the show way back when, I, I wasn't routinely asking that. So that's great to ask about. 
Stuart, Stuart looks like he's like furiously looking things up here, so <laughs> let me know if you find anything that you want to say. <laughs> okay, keep going, Elena. Um, the uh, other question, other interesting pearl that I learned and would actually like to discuss with all of you guys was um, there seemed to be a little bit of discrepancy between the um, ID cases that were presented in the clinical pearl, per pearls this morning and then when I saw Dr. Gluckman um, with his curbside ID cases that this afternoon of around asymptomatic bacteria. And I mean, we know the only people that you treat with asymptomatic bacteria are pregnant women. And then something else that I just learned is of course, people who are gonna get some type of urologic procedure like a cystoscopy. But there's some um, data out there that patients who might be going for an orthopedic procedure and if they get a UA and it's positive, what do you do with that? And so the case this morning was like, do not treat them, just don't do it. And then Dr. Kluckman was like, well, you have to make your battles. And so, <laughs> you know, I think that that's interesting. The study he reviewed showed that, um, that you can treat the patients with the asymptomatic bacteria prior to their orthopedic procedure, but the, and if they have some type of complication of their joint, that the bacteria that grows from that joint or the, is actually not the same as the urinary organism that was treated. Now, aren't all patients going for an orthopedic procedure, at least at our institution, they're all getting uh, cephazolin anyways, right? So it's like, <laughs> yeah. why even, you know, are you just going to change that to something else at that point? Are you going to keep it on cephazolin and say, hey, go for that? Sure, go to the floor alone. So that's the right thing. choice. Right? Well, well, they're they're getting like one dose or twenty four hours, and I they're they're getting three doses. They're getting, they're, they're getting three doses at our institution. But like Q eight for twenty four hours, yeah. so yeah. which is yeah. enough for a UTI. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I, <laughs> all right. Thank so, you. yeah. I, I mean, the Dr. Finucane, who was on our show talking about asymptomatic bacteria, the the study he he wrote this article requiem. Uh, yeah, I can't remember the it's requiem for a heavyweight. Yeah and it's about urinary tract infections uh, in quote, air quotes, as he likes to say it. But the, the, for asymptomatic bacteria, when they looked at those patients in the orthopedic study, it, it was felt to be, the conclusion was it's a marker of morbidity. So it's kind of like low albumin. There's not that much you can do about it. Um, it's just a marker of morbidity, and those patients are gonna have worse outcomes, one of which is probably prosthetic joint infection. Just gonna say the dosage for ANSA for ETI is one gram Q12. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. For how many days? It doesn't say. That was it doesn't say. <laughs> that was my that was my true question. Infinite days. Okay. Aaliyah, anything else? Um I love to share the stage with other or the I don't know. Table. Okay, the let's table. let's bring in the uh the, let's bring in Justin Lee Burke. She doesn't know what to call us. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> the, with you Justin, I think you need to make that mic. Yeah. Yeah. That mic is you, for your six friends. foot two yeah. stature. I don't like that mic. Do you got a joke for us? Great. Um I'll work one by the end. Uh, uh, you guys didn't like my fun guy joke. And that was that was kind of the best I had. Um, but so the first one I went to was uh, a things we do for no reason uh, uh, talk, essentially by Lenny Feldman, Dr. Lenny Feldman. He's been on the show before, um, and it was it was basically performance. It was standing room only, one of the bigger rooms. There's a lot of laughs, a lot of gasps, a lot of uh, a lot of emotional roller coasters uh, as he went through some of the evidence. Um, we weren't going to him too much, but some of the brief ones was essentially that. There's good evidence that we don't need to be treating hypertensive urgency. We did an episode on that previously. Um, no need to ever use pre-albumin, and no need to ever use ammonia. Uh, he talked a little bit about some other things, but uh, those are kind of the big, big takeaways, I think, that are easy to summarize. Trey, you want to come, come join me for we'll, we'll talk about some of the GI updates. Just. All I know is about celiac. I'm excited about celiac. We have, we, there was a lot of, a lot of great, uh, I'll turn over the is celiac for you. For you. No, this is going to be perfect. This is going to be, this is going to be our shtick. <laughs> okay, we don't even need to talk about clinical stuff. We can just kind of talk about the big ones. What are you doing this week? Okay. Um, so first, uh, there was a great, uh, great review of the 2017 American College of Gastroenterology uh, treatment plan for generalized dyspepsia, or epidemic pain for about a month. Um, it's 2017, so maybe you guys know this very well. But is a good kind of algorithm for me. Um, basically, the three-step process, if you are over the age of 60 and have dyspepsia, you should get immediate EGD to rule out gastric cancer. If you are under the age of 60, uh, you should immediately get an H. pylori stool antigen or breath test, uh, just because the number needed to treat for symptomatic H. pylori infection was about seven. 
Sure, you like number of needed to treat, right? Oh, yeah. I thought I had a number needed to treat for you. A number needed to treat of two for duodenal ulcers. That's right. If you have a duodenal That's ulcer, hot. number needed to treat is two. Gastric yeah. ulcer number needed to treat is three, so very low number needed to treat. Uh, if you treat the H. pylori, or if the H. pylori test is negative, uh, you can then go to the next step in the algorithm, which is just an anti-separatory treatment, um, which there's some evidence that H2 blockers are equally uh, effective as PPI. So you just go to an H2 blocker. I feel like it's ping-ponging back and forth with PPI and H2 blockers. <laughs> so today it was, PPI, it, was, uh, it was H2 blockers. Okay, I wanted, I wanted to clarify, the dyspepsia over 60, regardless of if they've been treated with a PPI, I, I, I feel like I was taught initially, like, treat with PPI for six weeks, if it doesn't get better, then you would proceed to EGD, but you're saying, they were saying proceed, do not pass go, do not collect, just go straight to the, that was, yeah, that was, that was a big takeaway. Okay. Um, yeah, that was, and that was what I put in the infographic that's on Twitter today. So now <laughs> it's, it's kind of finalized. Now it's, it's, now so, it's canon. Uh, <laughs> this is great. If that's wrong, someone can write in and we can uh, have kind of a first Plus publication peer review. Oh, <laughs> yeah, man. This is what, this is what we live for. This is what it's all about. Uh, thank you, Matt. On the topic of H. pylori, uh, there was also some discussion on the Houston consensus. Um, three of the presenters were all from Texas and then oh. presented on the Houston consensus. So a bit uh, Texas presentation in the GI talk. What, what's that? Please. What's that? The state of Texas. Justin <laughs> can't stop talking about uh, Texas. Uh, uh, what, what was the Houston consensus? <laughs> the Houston consensus was a Delphi study where they looked at a lot of GI experts on who to treat, how to treat, and when to treat. Uh, but only from Texas. Uh, you had to be from Texas to be <laughs> No, it was experts from all over the nation. Um, uh, uh, it was a really big study. Is everything's bigger in Texas? Yeah. In Houston? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, who should be uh, testing? Can I off? Can I uh, uh, briefly please, interrupt? Please. Stuart's bringing a drum kit next year so that you can rim shot. I think it's a good. Maybe, probably we could just get an iPhone sound effect. Right. Right. Well, anyway, we can borrow some from IM Core. They have a lot of production value. <laughs> um, so, who should be treated? All patients with ulcers or uninvestigated dyspeps uh, dyspepsia. But also, there was a grade B recommendation for any patient with ITP. Uh, you know, uh, Immunothromocytic purpura? Nope. Immunothromocytopenic <laughs> purpura? Uh, because it's associated with H. pylori infections, there's a strong agreement to treat. Um, and then any first generation immigrants from high prevalent areas or those who have families with asthma infection should also be treated uh, or also tested. Tested is through biopsy, urea breath test, or stool antigen. It is okay to be on an H2 blocker or an acid, but if you're on a PPI, thank you, Stuart. Uh, the. Oops. The, uh, PPI has to be stopped four weeks before any testing. Um, how about celiac disease? Do you guys have any, any questions about it? I, think I would like to know how, how much bread can I eat if I have celiac disease? Phenomenal question. I got you. I got you. <laughs> I got you. you. Very interesting. Even 1 40th of a slice of bread can show histological evidence of celiac. So if it, you have celiac or a patient of celiac, um, it is pretty hard to get away with that. Whether that correlates to symptom that if one fourth, one fortieth of a slice of bread correlates to symptoms, I don't know, but histologically it's been proven. Justin, why don't we do like a myth busting? I love it. I'm gonna ask you a question and you're gonna tell me yes I'm or no. I'm gonna bust it or <laughs> let it go. Yeah. Beautiful, here we How go. That? Okay, so do patients with celiac have to be European or mostly are are they mostly European? Is it a white person disease? Phenomenal question. It is not. It is a global disease that that global burden of disease is across all countries. Okay, yeah. Particularly being Indian, uh, actually the case that they used was of an Indian person and um, mm. they uh, had a wonderful map of the world and relatively the higher prevalence is actually in northern uh, Indians, you would say. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. Fun fact, that's a great pearl. All right, Justin. Yes. Do you think patients with celiac have to are usually underweight? Uh, phenomenal question. Uh, they don't always have to be underweight. They can be of any weight Whoa. and still have celiac disease, right? Yeah, so, Amazing. so don't, uh, if your overweight patient has anemia or other symptoms, do not overlook celiac as a, as a possible cause. That's right. Um, Justin, do you think that patients with celiac is more of a pediatric thing and adults can't newly present with it? Trick, great question. Uh, <laughs> it can come in pediatrics, but you can also have what's called the adolescent honeymoon period where it will go away and you have no symptoms, and then it can represent later on in life. So awesome. an older person can also be, have their first presentation of celiac disease. What are the other myths of us? Those are my three big ones. How about uh, if a patient just starts eating a gluten-free diet um, and still seems to have symptoms, does that mean that they don't have celiac disease? No, because there's 10% of patients with celiac who are quote-unquote non-responders. So 
be on the lookout for that. Amazing. Cool. A lot of people have celiacs. The prevalence of 1%, which, uh, Matt, as you'll recall, is the same as ankylosing spondylitis. And uh, most patients don't know if they have it, so there's another thing to add to I wonder list. if every day we could talk, we could drop in ankylosing spondylitis. It's going to be the new jump rope. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so we have for you today, guys. Uh, any other, uh... Uh, thank you. Uh, don't forget to tip your waitress. <laughs> Justin, uh, Justin and Trey will be appearing at the Chatterbox tonight at 9 p.m. Is that true? Uh, yes. <laughs> what is the Chatterbox? Um, <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's bring up Emmy <coughs> and uh, get some get some more pearls here. Will you have ID pearls for us today, Emmy. Yes, yes. Readjusting the mic. I'm I'm not six feet here. <laughs> Um, so first up, I went to an ID uh, update from George Karam from LSU. He shared the Merino trial, which was a JAMA trial back in uh, 2018. It was patients <coughs> with E. coli or Klebsiella resistant to third generation cephalosporin, so these are your ESDLs, and were randomized to get either Piptazo or um, Miropenem. Now, the 30-day mortality rate was 12% in the Piptazo group and 4% in the Muropenin group. Um, a lot of these people up front, they weren't sure what they had going in, so there was, um, they, there was some cross in the trial between the two. But it does kind of have us thinking, when a really sick patient comes in, we classically use our, our bank Piptazo, but maybe we should be reaching for the carbapenins instead. Did they? <clears throat> Did they caveat this is with people who have a known risk for ESBL or that people that or just anyone that's super anyone sick? Anyone who was diagnosed with ESBL. We, so yeah. they previously had uh, gotten different medications before the randomization. But even after the randomization and moving forward, the effect was still pretty Did, did they mention what the attributable risk was for seizure? No, they did not go into that. Yeah. I will say that they did also check at 30 days for C. diff and resistance, and there was no difference between the groups. So that for those of you uh, worrying about using a stronger antibiotic, there wasn't much risk at 30 days. So something to think about. Next up is four quinolones. I know those are Matt's favorite drugs. To yeah, use. We, they're safe. Yeah, uh, we totally love them. Safe. First yeah. line for uh, rhin rhinitis, cystitis, yeah. whatever. Bronchitis, all of it. All the other systems. <laughs> yeah, so they went up uh, through some uh, FDA updates in the past year. In July, they talked about dysglycemia, which is both hypo or hyperglycemia, and also mental health side effects. And these go as far as people having delirium or coma. So not just mild there. And then also uh, in December, the FDA said that they are risk for the rare but serious complication of aortic dissection. So something oh, smokes. Yes, be aware I, for your market and I don't. I don't quite know what to do with that, Paul. Just uh, as you're lying there on the ground after your release sentence rupture, you know, like not having crushing chest pain that's reading into my back. Like, ouch. <laughs> Um, also from the ID talk, the partner two trial aspect uh, abstract is out, and the bottom line of that is U equals U. Mm -hmm. Now, do you guys know U equals U? Yes, I do because undetectable they, uh, equals untransmissible. Yes. Yeah. Well, also known as treatment as prevention. And Paul, Paul Sachs has written about this on his HIV and ID observations blog, which uh, is yeah is great, and that's that's been. That can't be said enough, I think. Yeah, so get those viral loads down. What happened in a study with MSM, this was the first major study in MSM populations where there were 75,000 condomless sex acts. There was no transmission of linked HIV, meaning that there was HIV transmission within the group, but no were uh, phylogenetically related HIV cases. Are you saying it was infidelity? Is that? I, I no comment. Okay. It just wasn't the same virus their partner had. That's yes. the, okay, got it. That is correct. Um, and then we went to an anaphylaxis talk today and actually had a great recording session with Dr. Olajumoke Faduba from UPenn. Um, we took a great session away, but I wanted to share a few more pearls that we didn't make it into the session. Um, she did mention about the seafood and iodinated contrast um, reaction, and that is not a thing. Now, the reaction to seafood is to the tropomycin protein, not to the iodine in contrast. So there is no relationship between the two. Now, the caveat is people who are allergic to seafood are more likely to be allergic to anything, 
ergo more likely to have a contrast reaction, but there's no special um, things that you have to do for your seafood allergy patients needing a CAT scan. Did she mention if the seafood was an IgE mediated or a non IgE mediated? I thought it was IgE. I, I believe so. Yeah. She didn't mention it, but I believe that's IgE. Whereas the contrast is a non IgE mediated yeah. reaction. Well, she was saying with the seafood, you get itching as well. So you could continue some involved with plus pruritus, right? Yep, those are IgE reactions, sounds like. The <laughs> <laughs> story checks out. Yeah. Story around. Yep. Thanks, Hans. Yeah. Um, High all around. <laughs> yes, and another thing that we can feel good about is the multiple studies on eggs and flu shots. So there is, and the CDC came out strong on this, saying that you can give any flu shot to anyone with an egg allergy. Fantastic. So no need for monitoring. And when people do have anaphylaxis, lay them supine, and your pregnant patients should be on the left side, and that's to relieve the pressure off the IBC. Just another thing to think about. Yeah, I like how, and she, she was telling them that they should, an IM injection on the lateral thigh through the pants is the correct way to give the epi. Um, don't mess, don't, don't take time trying to pull down, <laughs> pull down your trousers That's to like, get, yeah, just go straight through. And No Pulp Fiction style administration. And it, yeah, the, 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 IM, the IM is better, and, and you hold it in for 10 seconds. Um, because there's different formulations, but if you hold it in for 10 seconds, that, that should get all the medicine. And uh, there's plenty more in that. We're going to release a full episode on that. So, like um, Lantus, like, you know, from the lab pen when you yeah. take insulin, you can hold it in for 10 seconds. Got to hold it in. I did not know that. Yeah. I, yes. that, yeah. I, I don't counsel patients on giving insulin. I probably shouldn't know <laughs> Just that. Just give them the pen and go with God. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, you know, other people. Like our <laughs> See back with IDs is better. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. Okay. I'm a terrible doctor. Uh, <laughs> Cyrus the Younger, let's, let's get you up here. Awesome. Hey, guys. Great to be here. Uh, oh, Cyrus, I think you're going to need to adjust the mic. <laughs> Your frame is slightly bigger than, uh, than Emmy Okamoto, so. Yes, unless she's very, very dense. <laughs> she maybe, maybe has a pound or two on her. Okay. Very unlikely. Um, so, um, so, a couple, uh, went to a couple sessions today. I've been spread somewhat thin this conference, unfortunately, so missed a lot of the ones I really wanted to go to. Is that a joke? Ha! Um, huh, no. Um, <laughs> So the first one I went to was actually uh, on, um, it was on the uh, like physical diagnosis in pulmonary patients, and so like obviously I have to uh, put out a pulmonary plug. Uh, so Sal Mangione from Thomas Jefferson, I believe, was the one that gave that talk. It was fantastic. I mean, it was hilarious. Showed us some great um, kind of uh, tricks and like great little algorithm for um, using the physical exam kind of findings to help you figure out exactly what's going on in that person's thorax. And we actually, on our, um, on our Twitter feed, we posted a, a picture of that uh, from Dr. Mangione. So I think it's great. I think he'd be like a great person to, to talk to at some point in the future. Uh, physical diagnosis for him is, I mean, it's just beautiful to watch him talk about it. Um, and he's got this awesome, awesome Italian accent, which is just so cool. So, um, so yeah, <laughs> fantastic guy. Um, but then the, the, um, the session that I kind of went to and wanted to talk about was actually uh, given by Dr. Uh, David Winchester out of the University of Florida uh, College of Medicine. And this was on stress testing pearls. So I think it's something as internists we do all the time. Uh, if you don't have a cardiology service that takes all the chest pain patients. Um, so kind of a couple pearls that I think we could all learn from. Um, so uh, I don't know that there's any data behind this, but his kind of expert opinion and expert use uh, for the, uh, it, using the ASCBD risk calculator actually after you've already decided that you needed to stress someone. And so what he kind of talked about was, um, he showed this, this algorithm is also available on our Twitter, uh, so you can take a look at it. Um, but he basically said, okay, you can use your Diamond Forester, kind of figure out what kind of chest pain this is, um, and maybe use your CAD consortium score to get a little bit better resolution on it. But for those folks that are kind of like low intermediate um, pretest probability, uh, by, by like CAD consortium, for example, you can use that uh, ASCVD risk score, their, their kind of 10-year risk score, to determine whether they would benefit from uh, anatomic testing versus functional testing. And so lower scores, those people may not need a functional test. You could do a coronary CT, and those coronary CTs can give you, you know, several years of longevity. Whereas if someone has a higher ASCVD risk score, you may want to put them through a functional test. And the coronary CT you're talking about is the coronary CT angiography. That's correct. Yeah. Yes, the coronary CT angiography. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought that was that was really kind of a, a cool way to use that um, 
that scoring system, which I've never, never used before um, for that purpose. <laughs> um, kind of along a similar, uh, similar vein, is, since we just mentioned the, the coronary CT and geography, um, it's actually, he, he, taught, he spent a little time talking about this. It's a, it's a test, I think, that's becoming more and more available, and we, I mean, I, I love to order them when I can. Um, but, so it's, it's kind of cool. He mentioned that the negative predictive value for a coronary CT is 99%, uh, which I think is awesome. But then the positive predictive value is not so great. It's like maybe 50 to 70%. Um, and the, the, the reason being is that we can't really, uh, in the current, with the current coronary CTs, can't really assess severity of that lesion very well. So you may be able to kind of say, yes, there is something, but then the next, next step is you send them for, for left heart cap. And so um, kind of tipped his, his cap a little bit uh, towards the end of that statement by, by turning us on to the fact that over in California, there is a research group that is kind of looking at their coronary CTs and uh, running them through this kind of supercomputer driven algorithm and they're actually able to look at that stenotic lesion and calculate uh, an estimated fractional flow reserve, or FFR, based upon the kind of uh, contrast hemodynamics uh, in that, uh, at that, that stenotic point. So super cool, a uh, great way to get some data without actually um, you know, inserting a catheter. Hey, um, Cyrus, I have a, got a question for you. Yes, Stuart. So why is it difficult for some professors to get hired? Oh boy, huh. Um, well, Stuart, I haven't the faintest. Because they have a high tenure risk score. Oh my gosh. Okay, <laughs> all right, I'll buy it. I'll buy it, high tenure risk score, very good. Um, uh, I, I think I still remember my comment. Than. I think I still remember my comment. <laughs> well done, Stuart. <laughs> the, the, that is really exciting. The, fractional flow reserve, at least in concept, it's, I think it's really exciting. So the fractional fl flow reserve is like in, in an actual coronary angiography where they sort of try to measure the flow across a lesion and determine if it's uh, significant hemodynamically, right? And, exactly. Yeah. And if it's likely to be caught. So if they could do this non-invasively, I mean, that's almost like the, I don't know what you would call it, holy grail of... Uh, <laughs> The only of non I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure if you're an interventionalist, uh, you're not going to love that. The only problem with that is that uh, if we were to adopt that, then the meme that says that the outside hospital can perform cats for everything oh. would no longer apply. And that's a great meme, too, I know, so that would really stink. Yeah, would. Um, but I imagine patients would probably benefit more than that than the, uh, than the death of that meme would kind of impact the general community, so probably okay. Um, but I think, you know, it, it, it definitely, Matt, your point's very, uh, very important because I think it, it um, you know, puts another tool in the toolbox for us as internists, um, and, and really then you're kind of looking at, okay, if they go to CAT, it's for PCI, it's not for, you know, more diagnosis that may result in, well, just up try treat your goal direct to medical therapy. I'm kind of surprised, that maybe I'm misunderstanding, that Treya hasn't bum-rushed the mic yet, because uh, we actually just had a great recording today, because I feel like we're working with the assumption that all so I think we're using the term CAD, and we're talking about sort of obstructive CAD, and actually I think it's sort of been reclassified as sort of ischemic heart disease, sure. or not. And many women, and some men, not all of ACS is actually caused by obstructive, um, obstructive coronary artery disease. So it's, I, I, I'm, I'm less wildly enthusiastic about the, the FFR, because I'm not sure it's gonna be entirely that helpful it's a great in that specific case. Right, so uh, probably as things get more specialized, we're gonna be like, it's gonna be more complicated more, Thank um, God, yeah. finally, not this boring <laughs> cardiology stuff. Well, you know, that, and that brings up a point. Um, it, it's a lot more common in Japan to do endovascular ultrasound to actually look at the thickness of the, of the, of the uh, endovascular lesion, look at the, the fibrous cap, and what they find is that, the, obviously, the thinner fibrous caps are more likely to, to rupture. That's why you're more likely to get STEMI with a thinner fibrous cap than a thick fibrous cap, which you're more likely to get in STEMI because it doesn't cause an actual um, thrombin-mediated uh, uh, clot, if you have a thick fibrous cap, causes more platelet aggregation. And so it's more of a, of a soft plaque or a, a soft clot that then weighs back and forth and, and allows some uh, distal flow. Um, it, it probably has some implications when it comes to actually grading what the severity is as far as long-term morbidity and mortality, but I don't, I don't know if it, if it really is going to have anything to do with actually reducing morbidity and mortality except for grading that. Yeah. So that, that's, that's the way I think FFR is going to be used. And what's going to happen if they have <laughs> If they have a lesion, they're right. they're, they're going to get a cap. Yeah, yeah exactly. that's, that's a good point. Yeah, so, it's a point. Yeah, right, right. so the meme will exist. The meme will exist. Yeah, and I think also like uh, thanks, Paul, for mentioning that. So certainly, like the uh, um, I was fortunately here when they were recording that uh, stable ischemic um, 
uh, heart disease episode, um, and you know, uh, Shreya was kind of leading the team in that interview, and just kind of listening to it, great, some great pearls, I think, for our, for our, future, for our listeners in the future there. Uh, really important thing to, um, to, know, to know a little bit about as an internist. Great. Um, Cyrus, what else do you have for us? Sure. I think you had something. You had an app and uh, maybe some radiation stuff. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, so there. Uh, so Dr. Winchester also mentioned an app um, that can be used. So it's uh, if you go onto the Google Play Store or the App Store on your uh, iPhone and you search uh, multimodality AUC um, for appropriate use criteria, you can. Uh, there's an app there that basically um, it, it kind of takes you through the thought process of determining what are and are not appropriate stress testing uh, options for a particular patient. And so it kind of tells you, this one's a great test, this one's maybe not so great, and this one you shouldn't do. Um, so I think it's a great thing, like if you're sitting down with a patient who's kind of telling you a little bit uh, of a story that's, that's concerning, you're thinking maybe you do need to stress this person, it's a great way to have the options, and then even kind of turn it around and show it as a visual aid to your patient. Be like, so, so this is why I'm not, I mean, I know you heard about the, car, the heart cath, but this is why I'm not sending you for a heart cath. You know, it's really not something that's recommended, it's expensive, it has risks, etc. cetera. Um, so I think it could be a really powerful tool. Um, and it, it's produced by uh, Astolos, which is a, a pharmaceutical company. Um, but I think the, the data, I believe, draws from um, some literature out of the ACC AHA on, um, on, on, on uh, stress testing. So This, I don't know about you, Paul, but this is making me nervous about all the... Uh... The, the data is just going to drive everything, and it's uh, you know it's all smarter than we are, and we're just going to. You know, is, it, is this an existential crisis uh, yeah, that's fine. for doctors? We'll no. have guidelines. <laughs> we'll have guidelines. We'll have, no, I think part of the talk was guidelines actually narrow some of the um, the gender bias that's uh, an inherent sort of treating CAD between men and women, and also there's this great quote about guidelines make good doctors great doctors. So with it's that's what guidelines exist for. So I, I think that they'll we'll have some sort of guidance from that could be out there. I know we always refer, I guess we have to. Yeah, for sure. Um, I do, yeah, a couple other uh, quick, relatively quick ones. Um, so uh, one thing that Dr. Winchester talked about is kind of interesting, the dichotomy between the UK guidelines for stress testing and then the American guidelines, or like the ACC AHA guidelines. So in the ACC AHA guidelines, there kind of still is a, uh, a, a patient population for whom a, a plain old uh, exercise stress test would be recommended. And those are gonna be like your your kind of younger, lower risk, interpretable EKG um, folks that um, you know uh, maybe uh, maybe coming in with some chest pain that you're not particularly convinced about. Um, so so uh, that being said, in the European guidelines, like the UK Nice guidelines, um, they're um, they don't have uh, really any stress modality that they support uh, where there is no imaging associated with it. So uh, you see a lot more um, kind of stress echo. Um, the myocardial perfusion studies, uh, whether it's uh, pharmacologic stress or actual leotrenal stress. Um, so, so that's kind of like, I thought that was interesting, and um, there was maybe some thought that um, collectively we're going to move in that direction just because the imaging can be very useful. Um, and there are obviously limitations with, without having the imaging, um, but, but more to come on that. But the, yeah, I think this is going to dovetail into your next point, but the, the whole nuclear medicine stress testing that is a huge amount of radiation. Sure, so I think that's sure, that's, that's the concern. Like you see, <laughs> you know, and, and the younger the patient is, the more the more time that radiation has to grow into something bad. Mm -hmm. Like if they're seventy five years old, give them a nuclear nuclear stress test every year. Sure. Yeah. At forty, <laughs> they end up with an extra appendage. Uh, <laughs> Other exposures, just plain flight yeah. right now. Um, and I, the caveat, Paul and I are both, uh, you know, we're, we're sleep deprived. Everyone, <laughs> actually, the whole team is. We were out late last night, and yeah. our our uh, the sleep to private lecture, they told us I'm basically drunk right now, so I can't awesome. be held responsible for anything I'm saying. It's outstanding. Oh, it's good. <laughs> You're doing great, buddy. Let's go for a drive. <laughs> and a drive. Um, so um, yeah, the, so thank you for that. The last kind of thing that I wanted to, to touch on is actually um, there are some interesting strategies which I had never heard of to kind of mitigate the um, radiation exposure in your patients, um, and so that actually. Uh, would require you or your team to kind of have a, a discussion with cardiology or the cardiology techs that are kind of running the show. But for both coronary CT and for um, the myocardial perfusion studies, there are certain things you can do. So the way in which the coronary CT is gated and the way the protocol is actually um, uh, kind of uh, run for that particular study. Hold on, hold on a sec. Let Chris, <coughs> let Chris cough it out. Chris, are you okay? Can you breathe, Chris? Do we need to be? I'm good. Is this <laughs> Are, are you itchy? No, I'm good. 
I don't know what happened. Sorry. Like, Gillis is last, but I can try and I'm like, I'll do it. We can cap you. That's pretty my own. Oh, I'll see you guys. So, uh, so yeah, uh, I'll rewind briefly. Um, so, yeah, basically with the coronary CTs, the way that they're protocoled, uh, you can have kind of more or less exposure to radiation based on whether it's using like a predictive model um, in conjunction with the, the, um, the heart rhythm that's kind of being monitored versus if it's kind of just recording. Um, so depending on, on how that is set up, you can kind of be exposed to lesser, uh, to more or less radiation. And then um, something super cool with the myocardial perfusion studies is typically when we do those, at least at my institution, we'll get rest imaging and then stress imaging and then rest imaging to kind of see if there's a reversible defect. Well, what Dr. Winchester said is that you can actually shave off time, cost, and radiation exposure um, by just asking them to do the stress imaging first particularly in your patients that you're maybe not as convinced. Again, if you use that ASCBD trick and you kind of feel like they're low intermediate, but you're still getting the NPS for whatever reason, um, you know, you can ask them to do the stress imaging first, and if there's no abnormality during stress, then you don't need to do anything else. I like it. Super cool. Saves the patient the radiation. Awesome, right. guys. Thanks. Thank you. Cyrus the Younger. Okay. Paul, Aaliyah, you got anything before we... Uh... Before we get to the wrap up here, oh, can I do my, my NAFL fun fact? Yeah, please. I can't remember if we talked about it. I don't think we talked about this yesterday, but there's a great talk uh, about the alcoholic fatty liver disease and NASH. And you know, I still feel like we're kind of limbo in terms of how to treat, but it's lifestyle modification primarily. So it's if it's diet, like just have them lose some weight, easier said than done. We know this, difficult to sustain. Um, but the thing that was kind of fun is you can actually encourage them to do one thing positive, and that's actually drink coffee. So caffeinated drip coffee decreases the risk of progression of fibrosis. But it was not French press, right? Uh, I don't think French press was checked. Um, okay. But tea does not work, soda does not work, decaf does not work. Curing's probably okay. Um, <laughs> Wonderful. Put back the environment. Well, sure. But it's, I mean, the world's on fire. It's going to be gone 20 years anyway, so go to town. Um, I can't <laughs> Oh, so sorry. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's nice because there's so many things that we tell the patients that you cannot do. So stop drinking alcohol and please exercise and you can't eat salt and you can't eat this. So to be able to say one thing that you can do that's actually enjoyable, go ahead and drink some coffee, it's going to help you. I think it's a nice thing to tell patients. So I enjoyed that for all. Excellent. Can I go over the CKP or do you want to go to the wrap-up? Uh, well, let's, let's see if, uh, okay, go for it. Any other pearls? I want to hear about syncope. Syncope. Do you build this up now? <laughs> uh, all of my phone. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so uh, a couple of clinical pearls from syncope that I thought were very useful. Um, so we, we talked about this before, that uh, in order to, to rule out syncope, rule in seizure, to look at the differences between the two, we talked about lateral tongue biting being the most uh, specific marker for seizure, although it's not present in most, most cases of seizure. What was interesting, though, was that incontinence was not helpful in actually diagnosing syncope versus seizure because most patients with syncope have extreme incontinence. And so it didn't really help, right? <laughs> That's good. good. And then, so we, we went from that and actually talking about the PESIT trial that came out uh, a couple of years ago. We talked about this on our podcast, uh, I think like episode 32, 33, something like that, SYNCP update uh, trial, or SYNCP update uh, episode. So what was interesting about this one was that the PESIT trial found that 17% of patients admitted to the hospital for syncope uh, actually had diagnosed uh, pulmonary embolism. Now, when you look at the, in the, the percentage of patients that were admitted to the hospital, in this trial, 27.7% of patients who presented to ED with syncope were admitted to the hospital. In the United States, about 80% are admitted to the hospital. Canada, 13% are admitted to the hospital. Um, of those patients that were admitted to the hospital in the PESIT trial, two thirds of them had a major PE that you probably would have found otherwise and would have admitted them for PE, not for syncope, necessarily. And so when you exclude those patients, the, the incidence of syncope uh, for non-clinically significant rates of syncope, um, when you level them out by number of admissions that we have in the United States, would be similar to what our incidence of syncope is for patients admitted to the, admitted the hospital. That's a lot of wizardry math in the, in the background. I think I'm totally I lost. did not understand <laughs> that. I'm so sorry. One okay. more time at the, one more time. At slow so speed. It, so, PESA trial, uh, about a quarter of patients are admitted to the hospital with syncope. Of those patients who are admitted to the hospital, 17% of those patients had a pulmonary embolism. Right. In the United States, 80% of patients presenting to the ED are admitted for, for syncope are admitted to the hospital. Of those patients in the United States who are admitted to the hospital, 1% of them 
have a diagnosed PE. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, when you go back to the PESA trial, two thirds of those patients in the PESA trial had a major pulmonary embolism that otherwise would have been diagnosed as a pulmonary yeah. embolism, right? That's out of the 17% right. that were found having right. PE. Right, exactly. So one, were one third of them were essentially incidental, mm -hmm. uh, either subsegmental or mm -hmm. asymptomatic. Sure. Those are the patients that were, that were saying that, hey, you're admitted to the hospital in the United States with syncope, not admitted for pulmonary embolism. We're finding 1% of them have a pulmonary embolism. Okay, so we're over admitting and the, so the, inc the actual incidence for our over admitted patient population actually levels out to what you should have seen in the PESA trial if you were to admit 80% of the patients who are admitted from the PESA trial. When you compare this to Canada, 13% of patients who come to the ED in Canada are admitted for syncope, okay? Of those patients, 2.5% had a pulmonary embolism. So obviously, um, we're probably over admitting in the United States, number one. Number two, that when you level those out, it's not really significantly different. Um, and when you look at all the studies together, consider that after a structured workup, which includes obviously an EKG and an H&P prior admission, up to about 3% may still have an undiagnosed PE. So you still need to be on the lookout for it, but it's not necessarily something that, that was initially like the sky is falling with, for the PESA trial. Right. What, what I did find concerning though, what's the most common ECG finding for PE? Normal sinus rhythm. Yeah, normal sinus rhythm, right? So you're saying that the structured workup includes an EKG or ECG, but then the most common finding is normal sinus rhythm. Great, thanks. Um, so the recommendation obviously was to do a well scored D dimer and then just use clinical decision making from there. Okay, so when we're talking about the workup of syncope, <laughs> all right, you can probably cut this out, but, I, but we this said is not the right? Normal neurologic examination, 0% yield for doing any kind of head imaging. So don't do it. For echocardiography, for all patients with syncope, 1% yield, okay? So for all patients with syncope, if you've got an echocardiogram, it costs $100,000 to diagnose one cardiac etiology for syncope. Not worth it. Um, if you instead looked at patients with normal ECG, the yield was 0%, which is kind of funny, right? But if you suspected that they had CAD, the yield was 5 10%. So the actual cost to diagnose one cardiac syncope was anywhere from $35,000 to $100,000, depending on what the, the actual clinical context was. What I found interesting, though, was that when you look at diagnostic yield for carotid sinus massage, especially in an elderly patient who had an unexplained history um, and had a suggestive history of cardiac disease, the diagnostic yield was 4 to 6% and actually found an etiology about half the time. But do you remember when we talked about carotid sinus massage, you sequentially give firm pressure for like five seconds and it drops their systolic pressure by like 50 and, their, yeah. and they may have bradycardia and he mentioned or probably that. 10 yeah. seconds of yeah. He's like, uh, <laughs> yeah, seconds. He said you need to listen very closely for a brewery first. Yeah. <laughs> so that's issue number one. And issue number two was check their vital signs first, obviously. Yeah, you might want to do it in the ER, probably, uh, right, where it's probably. actually like an continuous ICU, monitor, ICU yes. level yeah. care, yeah. continuous yes. monitor. And, and, then, and then similarly, for patients that have recurrent syncope, tilt table test had a diagnostic yield of 49%, which actually makes me kind of upset. Those are very hard to get in my experience. Yeah, yeah. very, very hard. All right, last one. Canadian syncope risk, risk of score um, is what was recommended. If you've never used it before, it's actually a very simple tool, just a few questions. You can go to MedCalc and find it, MDCalc, and uh, assesses the 30-day risk and, and assists with clinical decision-making whether or not to admit or not. All right, that's all I have. Any, any final pearls? We have, we have one more recap tomorrow, so we can, and we can put some stuff in there. Aaliyah, anything? I'll give you the last word. Can I just say smoking is bad? <laughs> smoking. I just like to say that, just to add that in. Even if I'm like already dying from cancer, I should I, I shouldn't just like keep no. going. No, just don't do it. Okay. Even if you have cancer, even if you have uh, you no you are dying dying from cancer, and you're getting some type of treatment, that treatment's not going to work. It's just not going to help you. It's not going to be better. Just don't do it. Okay. All right. I you know I always whenever I think of that kind of thing, I think uh, this is a, a some oh, many of our listeners won't get this if they're younger than me, but the uh, grumpy old men movie Burgess Meredith is like his character eats a pound of bacon every day and smokes <laughs> chain smokes cigarettes <laughs> and he like dies on a park bench like overlooking a lake at like age one hundred. I'm like I'm just like that's that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Cyrus. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. I had to get. I had to get this one quote out from the day, again from Sal um, Mangione. So he said this, I put it on the Twitter because I thought it was super cool, but he said, 
If you undertake a path where tests can get tests, you'll find that usually at the end of the path, there'll be a surgeon, a lawyer, and an undertaker. So I thought that was really cool. Thank you. All right. So uh, this has been another episode of The Curbsiders. Bring you a little knowledge for your brain home, can we? That's I will turn off. Get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. There will be no show notes for this episode. Yeah, that's that's right. We're committed to providing you times changing and high volume. <laughs> <laughs> Stuart's having a TIA. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's right. We're committed to providing you high value practice changing knowledge and to do that we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, review the show on iTunes or contact Matt personally. At the cryptire at gmail.com. We'll send you a reply at his leisure. A special thanks to our producer for this episode. Who is our producer? Everyone. A, Everyone. A special <laughs> thanks to our, our, our uh, videographer for this episode, Dr. Christopher Chu, and then to our whole team of correspondents who you've heard on air, and to our wonderful guest, Dr. Alina Chisky. And to our social media team, Hannah R. Abrams on Twitter, Beth Garth Scarvatelli on Instagram, and Chris, the Chu Man Chu on Facebook. Until next time, I'm tired. <laughs> and, uh, and Cyrus asking pinch hitting on Twitter for this conference at ACP. Thank you, Cyrus. Uh, I've been Dr. Matthew Franquato. I'll be interesting. <laughs> Strong. Thank and you. I remain Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye, Paul. All right. Tight 55 minutes. <laughs> 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 <laughs>